Hi, my name is Richard Parrington. I'm here today to talk about a historian called Christoph Smyers, who's come to England from Antwerp University in Belgium, where he is doing a PhD into charismatic figures in the past who have received the stigmata. His interest in Courtney, he's, Courtney is only one of the candidates for his attention, is uh, uh, interesting because he brings a European perspective to what was going on in 1830s um, with the Battle of Bosendon Woods where Sir William Courtney, alias uh, Sir William Courtney, real name John Tom, was the main protagonist. The Battle of Bosendon Woods was the last battle on British soil and uh, it was a very tumultuous event with the death of six or seven of the followers of Courtney and Courtney himself uh, and the leader of the military, um, uh, lots of people injured. Uh, the event is fairly well known but it's not as well known as it deserves to be and uh, the website that I run uh, proposes to try to inform people, educate them about the, uh, the, the, the battle and the various characters and protagonists involved. Uh, before I start, uh, I'd like to make a small apology for the use of the word madness. Um, Courtney, like a lot of uh, revolutionaries, was dubbed as a madman. Uh, madness wasn't really understood very well in those times. This was pre-psychiatry. Uh, uh, on the website we have a very erudite essay about madness um, and th the way it affects various leaders and various uh, politicians, um, warriors of the past, um, and it goes into great depth. It's been written by a uh, eminent psychiatrist named David Abrahamson. Um, so with that little apology out of the way, I would like to introduce you to uh, Christoph Smyers, uh, one of the most articulate and brightest historians I've met, who um, has honoured our website with uh, yet another interview, and um, I hope you enjoy the video. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christoph Smeyers from the University of Antwerp. I'm here in Canterbury today to look at Sir William Courtney because he fits into my research on 19th and 20th century British stigmatics, people who display the wounds of Christ, which uh, John, John Tom or William Courtney, depending on who you, who you read, uh, displayed in the later stages of his life. The main purpose of your visit uh, this time is to um, contribute something for our website about yes. political ambitions of Courtney. Um, what have you got to say? Uh, well, I've done a lot of research lately and I'm particularly interested in one, one aspect of the whole Courtney affair, if you want to call it that, which is the studies that have been conducted so far on him have either focused on his madness and on his psychological inner lives, if you want to call it that, on um, his psychological state and how that influenced his exuberant behavior or his exuberant actions and that that's one strand of analysis and the other has very much focused on uh, what I call a social and economic analysis so looking at the people who followed him at the, the social and economic conditions here in the neighborhood and how that um, attributed to his success even if it was only for a little while Okay, um, so that, that's, uh, I think that's the line that Barry Ray yes, took yeah. in his book um, about the agricultural labourers, uh, which was more following the, the, the terrible conditions that they yes. were suffering uh, and working under, and less about the, the colour and the flamboyance of Courtney. And it was an important study because it moved away from what I think was 
too often the case where they move where they just focused on uh, Courtney himself and approached his followers as a collective and not as individuals who all, all had their own reasons of following Courtney but I do think that um, it's moved away too far from Courtney as a person and as a leader interesting so I want to go back and look at his charisma and I want to look at the way he merged religious motives with his political agenda and that's that's really why I'm here to mm. give some kind of cultural context because we've, we've had the psychological context and we've yeah. had the socio-economic context but if we zoom out not just to Britain but to the whole of Europe in the 1820s 1830s we see a lot of cases that are very similar and I think Courtney is part of a much larger tradition than that. Hmm. Where the religious context um, um, acts upon their political ambitions and their... Yes, yes. Yeah. Especially since the French Revolution, so 1790s already, you see across the continent and also here in Britain a tradition of um, political radicals who infuse their programs with biblical texts and prophetic messages and who profile themselves not just as radicals or as um, what would you what you would call proto-socialists or proto-communists -communi but also as um, mystical prophets so very often accompanied by all kinds of spectacle and miracles like Courtney would uh, would well would prove quite often um, in France you have a whole a whole tradition of these mystical radical prophets leading up to um, the socialist experiments that happened here in Britain as well with Robert Owen who established a, a utopian community which he said was driven by um, a divine mission for example. Um, you had in the 1790s here in Britain Joanna Southcott who was a prophetic, a prophetic seer who remained apolitical but all her, well, her, her spiritual heirs if you want to call it that um, took up revolutionary ideas and they were, they were found very often involved in um, radical uprisings in London, for example, in the 1830s as well. Yes, I suppose the, the thing that would occur to me is that the, the disenfranchised poor um, mm -hmm. would have only really had that sort of literary access through the Bible and through mm. those kind of stories. Um, so that was the language that was being used um, to to affect their behaviour. And yes. to, it's a way to tap into to people's tap in. uh, emotions and, and yeah. their, po their poverty as well. <clears throat> I think there are some uh, Marxist historians who have written about the 1830s and say that the, the working people at that point were not ready for um, an entirely secular ideology. So. If you had to, if you wanted to recruit, and if you wanted to make sure that people followed you, you had to uh, infuse your program with with messianic messages, like Courtney did, for example, and like Jonas Southcott did before him, and like um, people in the continent did. just talking about Joyce Michel who's a fan of the Courtney website and uh, she, you know, she'd like to propose something that you could be thinking about. Mm -hmm. This is slightly off topic but it's, uh, it's a constant uh, motif in the Courtney story um, and she talks about the madness um, of Courtney uh, and her fourth point is that um, government representatives preferred labelling him as a madman mm -hmm. rather than examining the social causes of unrest and for the families of his supporters in their pleas for clemency for the participants in the Battle of Bosendon Wood they portrayed Courtney as a character charismatic madman who subverted the will of his followers after discounting the self-serving reasons for all the above I still conclude that he was a madman at times <coughs> and also an inspired leader 
who was influenced by current progressive ideas, which is interesting, mm -hmm. and who influenced others deeply, particularly those who lacked a political voice. Can you add something to that? I Crystal? agree, mostly. Um, I think you can be both. You can be a madman and a charismatic leader, and the mere fact that he profiled himself as such is, is quite telling. I didn't come across many references labelling him as a madman before the battle and even before his death as such. And even after his death, it was usually in combination with with a socio-economic analysis of, of the region as well. You can see that in that survey that happened in 1839 already, um, where which resulted, of course, in, in the parish church being established here in Dunkirk, um, a school being established as well to battle and to prevent similar cases of insanity taking a hold of the people. Um, if he's a madman or not, he, in the court case in 18, 1833, when he was accused of perjury, um, he labelled himself as such before he was sent off to um, Barming Heath, the, the mental asylum in Maidstone. He, he allegedly said, if I'm a madman, you can't really punish me because everything I do is a consequence of my insanity. And I feel that in the years, especially when, once he gets out of the, the asylum, he, he capitalises on, on that label. I don't know if that's an no. answer. Yeah, that's great. That's a great uh, response. I'm sure Joyce will appreciate your thoughts on the matter. <clears throat> I don't actually agree with Joyce because um, I, I don't think he was a man. And I think he mm. was forced by extenuating circumstances to act in a way that was not the yeah. not the correct way of a natural revolutionary leader it wasn't cold cold hard calculated uh, activity mm -hmm. but that was because events happened so quickly yeah. that uh, he really lost control of the whole idea behind his revolution and uh, acted irrationally, but I don't think it was madness. I do feel that when he's being studied, there is very often a, um, a gap between the years before he became collocated and the, the final weeks of, of the Courtney saga. Whereas if you look at it from a broader cultural context, there is much more continuity in his program. You can see that the, the basis and the foundations of what he what he was trying to do were already there when at the time when he came into Canterbury and even before that when he was still in Cornwall he was talking about um, uprooting the establishment and uprooting the status quo and, and um, creating a platform for social justice and that's something that he took with him until Bozen and Wood. So d d this leads on to your uh, recent ideas about his political motivations and political ambitions. Yes. <clears throat> And it's interesting what Joyce said, because um, if you look at the larger cultural context of figures like Courtney, um, the, the concept of madness or the notion of madness is, is just there in pretty much every case. So and it's, it's used to discredit the figure in, in person, but very often the person in, in question can harness it and use it to his advantage or her advantage in most cases. break and a an interesting aside uh, into one aspect of Courtney's behavior in his life when he was um, politicking when he was trying to become a member of parliament um, in the Canterbury's book it mentions that Courtney was going out practically every night to different dinner parties and he was the toast of the town mm -hmm. He was the he was the pop star of the time down here in Canterbury, yeah. and um, that he had a huge female fan base. Um, and you mentioned something about their disappointment at the trial. 
Can you recap on that one? Yes, that's not in the Cantabriensis book, but um, in the coroner's no, not the coroner's report, the, the the reports of the court case in 1833, when he's born false witness to a, a smuggling case, I believe. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Um, the final verdict after Courtney's many speech or many many attempts at a speech, but he keeps being silenced by the judge, um, is that he should be collocated in the Maidstone uh, mental asylum, and. Um, Courtney remains relatively neutral to this verdict, but as the account goes, the courtroom is uh, full of female supporters of the, co of the Courtney phenomenon who all start crying, and um, there is a general scene of dismay to, to the verdict as Courtney leaves the, the courtroom. All these, I mean, you see all the, the women of Canterbury not knowing what to do with themselves. And it's, even, even it's a bit like the death of Rudolf Valentino. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, you know his his well known attraction for the opposite sex has been documented, but there's no real evidence of any promiscuity on his part. Um, although he must have had lots of opportunities. Obviously, when he was up here. Mm -hmm. In Canterbury, he'd left his wife yeah. down in Cornwall, um, and you were saying that part of the much neglected story is the re religious aspect of his life and his um, his conditioning. Mm -hmm. um, so, do you think that that affected his behaviour as a gentleman in Canterbury? I don't know if it affected his behaviour, but it definitely affected the importance of. Uh, the potential behaviour he displayed on on what he was trying to do. I think he was here with priorities. He had a programme that he wanted to fulfil. It's a programme that he had when he was still in Cornwall, when he was still with his wife. And it's a programme that he tried to bring into practice up to the point of his death. And I think that was very much the main reason he was here. Um, he was attracting a lot of attention. He was, he was very popular. Even after he came out of the asylum, he was again. He could again find uh, supporters from across Kent. But for him, I, the impression I have from the sources is that it was always in function of realizing his his um, radical program. Um, and it's for me, it's it's very interesting that religion plays such a large part in his rhetoric, and that is something that has been largely neglected up to now. Um, you see that as soon as he enters Canterbury, people start comparing him to the Messiah. I think I've got it here as a quote. Um, his beauty of feature and expression closely resembled the paintings of Christ by Guido and Carlo Dolce, and he's very much uh, typified as this kind of Italian-style um, Christ figure with the, with the lush beard and the side parting in his hair. And it's something that you see he, he cultivates more and more aptly as his career here in Canterbury goes on, especially after he comes out of the asylum. He, um, he very often sheds his, his velvet outfits for much more simple robes. Um, and of course he starts calling himself a messiah as well and, and the saviour of the poor. And that fits in very nicely with that larger tradition I was talking about earlier of um, radical mystics who saw themselves as messiahs and who um, in retrospect, also saw Christ himself as some kind of so proto-socialist. So, of course, he was just a carpenter's son who um, stood up for the poor and would rather befriend the, the poor fishermen than the, than the priests. And that's, that's very much a model that uh, Courtney himself tried to emulate. You were also saying um, his criticisms of the priesthood and the bishops um, and the monarchy. Would you like to elaborate on that? What, what have you discovered? Uh, that um, even when he was still in his teenage years, he was very sceptical of, of the institutional churches. So he, he wrote this letter to the bishops when he was still in Cornwall, um, telling that, saying that the people of England had unanimous, unanimously decided to, uh, to, to say that the, the bishops should vacate their diocese. And when there came no response, um, 
that was for, for Courtney himself a, a reason to draw a conclusion that there was something very rotten at the heart of, of the Church of England and of every institutionalised church in general anyway, which is also I think why he deliberately set himself apart from any denomination and um, though he was very religious and profiled himself as such, he would always remain uh, more or less independent, I feel. He would visit all the parish churches, for example, all the congregations. Um, it was more of a, a social act than a religious act for him to go to church. Oh. He would always dress up in his, uh, in his velvet, for example, when he would go to church. And that's also the reason why he was caught out with his false testimony uh, in the perjury, because he said that he had seen the smuggler, the assumed smugglers, and that they had not committed any crime. But then the priest remembered that there was this very elaborately dressed man sitting in his church at the point of um, the testimony. So there was something, it was clear that Courtney was lying. So uh, for him, church was very much uh, uh, one of the instruments to establish himself as a society figure. So if, if we if we situate Courtney within that broader cultural context of um, prophetic radicals, if you want to, if, if if that's how you want to define them, uh, we find that he's not some kind of unique nutcase, but rather he's he's firmly rooted in a tradition. And uh, for example, in, in the very year of the Bosnian and Wood battle, um, a man in Surrey called James Greaves set up what he called the Alcott House, uh, which was a utopian community that he said was um, propagated by a divine mission. And uh, this, this man was a, was a mystic in very much the same way as Courtney, just a bit more, a bit more, um, a bit more toned down, I'd say. <laughs> okay. Christoph, that was interesting. Now, you're going to um, talk a little bit about the way Courtney established himself as a religious e uh, leader and some of the techniques, methods that he used. Mm -hmm. that, that sounds like a very interesting topic for a conversation. Tell us about that. As soon as he entered Canterbury, he was compared to Christ and... Um I have the impression that his years in the desert, as he called it himself, the years in the uh, mental asylum, were a period where he um, thought much more radically of profiling himself as Christ. So he, he came out of the asylum calling himself a messiah. And um, you see that in the, in the dramatic increase in um, spectacular miracles that would um, accompany wherever he went in public. He was set to shoot down the North Star, for example, um, at some point he, he claimed to have shot himself and survived. Um, he, had the, he, he had the stigmata, so he showed the bleeding wounds on his hands um, to his followers, who would sometimes pray to him. And I think before the battle in Bosendon Wood, he would anoint his, uh, his followers as well and bless them. Um, and of course there is the, there is the fact that when, he, when he, he was shot or stabbed, we, I'm not entirely sure how he what was the fatal wound there? Um, Sarah Culver, who was allegedly his lover, came uh, ran to his body with a glass of water to um, to um, wet his lips and make him come back to life. Uh, As in the Bible story of yes. Christ 
uh, yeah, descending from the cross. Um, and of course, you know, one of the things that is um, part of that, we don't know whether it's true or not, but I mean, um, in the Canterbury book, it is said that he made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. There's no evidence for it, of no. course. There's no evidence, but um, that that would have that would have been on his mind and shaped his thinking about how he was going to make contact with these yes. with illiterate yeah. uh, labourers. And he called himself the King of Jerusalem as well, so that must have come from somewhere. Mm. But again, it's not it's not Courtney who came up with this cocktail of um, religious enthusiasm and political radicalism. It's something you see across the eighteen across Europe across the eighteen thirties and even before that. It's also that um, he was a critic a, a critic of institutionalized churches, and he he propagated a return to primitive Christianity, so back to pre Bible times basically. Um, and it's that kind of Christ that was tapped into across Europe as well. So the, the social Christ, the Christ who looked out for the poor and um, before the church corrupted, corrupted the message. Um, and again, it's, it's a, a case of how far did, his, did that persona reach to show that when he died, um, when Courtney died, the, the, the Funeral, the funeral uh, procedure was done very quickly and outside the church to not uh, further revoke ideas of um, Courtney as a Christ-like figure and he was thrown in an unmarked grave so that people wouldn't stand around it waiting for him to arise after three days like they did with several um, 19th century mystics who were buried and who had, uh, who had claimed that they were a messiah um, oh. I didn't realise that the story had been used by so many other people. <laughs> <laughs> he, he wasn't the first, but he was definitely not the last either. Right? Um, well, I think, think that's, a, that's probably a good point to finish on. He wasn't the so. first and he wasn't the last. <laughs>